Welcome to the CBS Radio Mystery Theater Archives. The only YouTube channel which has the original classic episodes of the CBS Radio Mystery Theater in order with no ads. Thank you for listening. And now, enjoy the show. CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Settle down and let me ask you a profound and difficult question. What is faith? I'm frank to tell you, I don't know. The word faith is in the dictionary. But do we know that the man who compiled the dictionary knew any more about faith than we do? Well, I should like to give you my favorite description of faith, which comes from the Bible, from the book of Hebrews, where it is written... Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And that is what our story is all about. Mr. Mather, I did what you said. I did just as you said. I followed to the letter what you said to do. I've forgotten what I said. You said, wait till the sun is straight overhead, then go to the big rock, the, the one that's worn off at the top. You said... To, Take off all your clothes and lie on your belly and press your face hard into the rock and lick the rock with your tongue, you said. Lick the rock 29 times with your tongue. Then then put your clothes back on and go home and you'll be all right. Did I really say all that? Did I really? I must be losing my mind. <laughs> mystery drama, Faith and the Faker, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elspeth Eric and stars Howard Da Silva. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Sinoff, the sinus medicines. I'll be back shortly with Act One. is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Such is the theme of our story, and the leading player is a man who never had faith in anything but himself, and not in the better part of himself either, as we shall soon discover. I'll get the door open in a second, Mr. Mather. Oh, you must be drenched. It's all right, it's all right. Go on in, Mr. Mather. After you. Oh, Liza, I, I, I can't stand the pain. Oh, there, there, my dear one. Somebody help. The pain is... I'm dying. Oh, look here, Judd. I've, I've brought Mr. Mather. What did you say? Oh, the pain is... Mr. Mather is here. Uh, You'll be all right, Judd. You said Mather? Indeed I did. He came out in this terrible uh, storm just to make you well again. He wouldn't come before. Well, never mind about that. He's here now. Uh, uh, Mr. Mather, uh, 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 show Judd you're here. Uh, come closer. Hello, Judd. You're here. I'm here. Uh, For all the good I can do you. Oh, you can do it, Mr. Mather. Do what, for heaven? Uh, make the pain go away. How am I supposed to do that? Make my leg the way it used to be. Look, look how it is now. Just, just look at it. It's all swollen. Uh, Twice its regular size. It's turning yellow. Fix it, Mr. Mather. 
Judd, I can't. I don't know how. You need a doctor. There's no doctor on the island. You know that, Mr. Mather. Then go to the mainland. There's a doctor there. With his leg the way it is, where he'd never reach the mainland. I don't want no doctor. Not any doctor. I don't have faith in them. I have faith in you. In you, Mr. Mather. Oh, how did this happen? I mean, to your leg. Well, he, he was chopping wood. His foot slipped and the axe caught him right at the ankle. Uh, it didn't seem like such a deep cut. He's had worse. So we, well, we bound it up and he went about his business for a couple of days. And, and then the swelling started. And then the fever set in. Oh, feel his forehead. He's burning up. Where's the axe? The... The axe. The axe, the thing that caused the whole mess. Where is it? Well, why, right there by the door. Oh, what are you going to do, Mr. Mather? You, you won't cut my leg off, will you? Oh, of course I'm not going to cut off your leg. I'm going to punish this axe. I'm going to make it suffer. I'm going to torture it. I'm going to make it endure such pain. But, but how? How are you going to do that, Mr. Mather? I'm going to crucify it. Crucify? Give me some strong nails and a hammer, Eliza. Oh, yes, Mr. Mather. Y you're going to crucify the axe? Right here, on this door. Don't you think it deserves to be crucified? After what it did to you? Oh, yeah, yes, yes. Oh, here are the nails and, and the hammer. <laughs> now, you'll hang on this door, you villain... <clears throat> You'll hang there till you waste away and rot. You understand? Oh, and Judd. Uh, uh, yeah, Mr. Mather? Be sure you hold on. Hold on to your life. Hold on to your faith. I will. I'll try. I will. The thing that tried to kill you is being punished. Now I'm going to tell you what else you must do. Tell me. I'll do it. I promise you. I'll do it. I want you to lie very still in your bed and keep your eyes fixed on the axe. Never let your gaze wander from the axe on the door. Think to yourself how the axe is suffering. Curse it if you like. God will forgive you, for believe me, the devil is in that axe. Have faith, Judd. Keep your faith constant and keep your eyes on the axe. God bless you, Mr. Matter. Now I must get back to my wife. Oh, how, how is your dear wife? The same, the same. Good night to you both. Oh, good night. God bless you, Mr. Mather. Now, wasn't that terrible of me, never thinking to ask about his poor wife, paralyzed all these years, and him not able to do a thing to help her? Be quiet, woman. I'm watching... The axe. Faker. Miserable, lying Faker. Charlotte. Hypocrite. Imposter. If there is a God in heaven, he'd strike me dead for my endless frauds. One after another. My life, why do they believe me? Why do they have that idiotic faith in me? I've never told them I could cure them of anything. More than that, I told them I couldn't. They go on believing and having faith. Faith in me. Can't they see? Don't they know? If I had any such power to heal, I'd give it all to Mary. To the one person in all this world I truly love. To my saintly, my adored own wife. Mr. Mother! Mr. Mother! My beautiful Mary, who sits all day in her wheelchair by the window and watches. Go, she says. They believe in you. They have faith in you. Go. And I go. And I know I can do nothing. I don't even know what ails them. But I have been some darn fool rigmarole. And sometimes it works. I don't know why. Mr. Mother! Wait up for me. Oh, who is it? It's Moses, Mr. Mather. What are you doing out in the storm? Why aren't you back in that cave you call home? I've been looking for you. I, I had to tell you, Mr. Mather. It, it worked. What worked? I'm cured. 
my stomach's cramped up. The sickness is gone. Oh, Mr. Mather, I, I did what you said. I did just as you said. I forgot what I said. Forgotten? How, how could you forget? You, you cured me of the sickness that was taking away all my strength that was making a skeleton of me. How, how could you forget what you said for me to do? Well, come on. Come, what did I say? Uh, you said, Moses, wait till the sun is straight overhead. Then go to the big rock, the one that's worn flat on the top. And you said, take off all your clothes and lie down on the rock, but don't look into the sun or it'll blind you. No, you said, lie on your stomach and press your face hard into the rock and lick that rock with your tongue. Now, you said, lick the rock 29 times with your tongue. I do this every day for eight days and you'll be all right. Did I really say all that? I must be losing my mind. Oh, you've got a mind different from other minds. We all know that. You all know nothing. Nothing. Well, it's probably true. We island people are very ignorant, but Mr. Mather, we have faith, you see, and that makes up for our ignorance. Look, I'm glad you're better. Now, I've really got to be going home. I don't like leaving my wife alone, especially with a storm like this. The house might be struck by lightning. Oh, how is your wife? Just the same. You can't do nothing for her? Nothing. Hmm. Uh, your wife's not an island girl, is she? I understand you met her on the mainland. That's right. Now, you see, she ain't got the faith in you that we island people have. Uh, that's the whole trouble, Mr. Mather. She just needs to have the faith. Mary? I'm here, dear. I just made some tea. I thought you'd need it. I do, I do. It's on the kitchen table. Come join me. I shall, of course I shall. I want to hear what happened to poor Judd. I think I'll have a spot of rum in my tea. You? No, not for me. Now tell me. Oh, Mary. Why do you make me go on these fool errands? I don't think they're foolish. Oh, there's Judd lying in bed with his legs swollen the size of a tree trunk and the color of a lemon. I asked him how he'd done it, and he said he'd cut his ankle with an axe. It wasn't much of a cut, so they just bound it up with something. And a few days later, it started to swell. Well, there he is. Can't move out of bed in terrible pain with a raging fever. So what did you do for him? What could I do? I don't know anything about such things. If I try to do anything, I could kill him. Oh, but you did something, didn't you? No, oh, yes, I did something. I crucified the axe. <gasps> crucified the axe? Well, they were both looking at me, and I felt so helpless. I did the first thing that came into my mind. I asked Eliza for hammer and nails, and I nailed the axe to the door. Oh. Then I told Joe to lie perfectly still, never take his eyes off the axe, to think how the axe was suffering for the sin it had committed. Mary, I don't know why I did that or why I said that. I thought, well, I guess I thought it would take the poor man's mind off his pain. It will help. I'm sure it will. You help so many people. Why can't I help you? I don't care for any of them. I care only for you. If only you knew how I love you. I know, dearest. More every day, I swear it. Each day I think to myself, no man has ever loved a woman as I love my Mary. But then the sun goes down and rises again. And as the day dawns, I think, I think I love her more today than I did yesterday. And yesterday I loved her so much I thought I would burst with loving her. And here it is another day and I love her even more. How can such things be? I don't know. I'm just content that they are. Mary, I must tell you something. What, my darling? It was not... It was not always that way with me. What way? I didn't always love you. No. When we met, I told you almost right away that I loved you. But that wasn't true. No. When I asked you to marry me and, and I said I loved you beyond anything on earth, that wasn't true. 
No. The whole first year we were married, I didn't love you. But then, then we decided to come here to live on this island. It would be cheaper to live here, we said. But I think it was something else that made us come here. I think, I think it was something in me that made me want to leave the mainland and all that sort of life that I'd lived there and to be on this, on this tiny spot surrounded with water set to the music of seagulls. I wanted to live here alone with you. It was then that I began to love you, not before. I know. Have you always known? Yes. I might have guessed. That's the sort of woman you are. Oh, Mary, there's a doctor on the mainland. If I could get him to come here... Now, darling, you know... Or if somehow I could get you to the mainland where he could take a look at you. Dearest, before we came here, we saw a dozen doctors. And they all said the same thing. Do you love me less because I can't walk? You know I don't. Well, But this doctor on the mainland, he would know of, of specialists, of medical centers. Things, things have been developed in the last ten years. That would all be very expensive, my darling. I could get the money somehow. How? I don't know. Somehow, borrow it. Borrow it from whom? Everyone here is as poor as we are. Oh, if we only had the stock in the silver mine that was promised us. I know. If only the old man hadn't died. What's the use of thinking about that? No, no use at all. None at all. So, let's think of other things. Happy things. Oh, now, who could that be? I'm not going out again in this storm. Mr. Mather. Come in, Eliza. Get out of that storm. Mrs. Mather. Mr. Mather, I, I had to come tell you right away. Judd's all right. He's all right. The leg opened up suddenly, just like that. He, he was lying on the bed, very still, like you told him to do, staring at the axe you nailed to the door. And suddenly I, I looked at his poor swollen leg and the flesh parted just below the knee and all this yellow poison began pouring out. And Mr. Mather, you know what else? At that very moment that the flesh of his leg parted, that axe dropped straight down to the floor. Straight down to the floor, Mr. Mather. I was standing right there, and I saw everything with my own two eyes. <laughs> What do you wish to ascribe this amazing happening? Was it coincidence? Plain luck? Was it some wisp of magic floating in the air? Was it the substance of things hoped for? The essence of things not seen? That is to say, was it faith? We'll come back to you shortly with Act Two. It's 19 degrees and we are... have passed since Mather visited the man with the sorely infected leg. And Mather's life with his beloved Mary has resumed its normal course. A narrow life, lived meagerly, yet happily, because of the great love between them. Then one day... Mary! Mary! Yes, dear? I'll be right there. No, I'll come to you. No, now don't you bother. This wheelchair gets me around very well. It's my chariot. <laughs> anyway, that's the way I think of it. Oh, what have you got there? It's a letter. A letter? Mm-hmm. Packet from the mainland was in the harbor when I was coming back from the market. Captain shouted to me and held up this. He was as surprised as I was. Now, who on earth would be writing to us? Oh, you don't suppose it could possibly be about the silver mine stocks? Oh, 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 no. Oh, no, it's too much. Is it about the silver mine? Oh, no, no, no. You remember a few weeks back I told you about old Moses who lives in a cave near the sea? Mm -hmm. How he was troubled with a bad case of diarrhea and the poor old man was near to exhaustion. He begged me for help. Well, what could I say? I said the first thing that came into my head. I said, go lie on the flat rock at midday. Lie on your belly for an hour. Then, because it didn't sound like much of a recommendation, I said, lick the rock 29 times. I don't know what made me say that. I suppose I like the sound of it. And did he do it? Faithfully, every day. 
And it worked. It actually worked. Oh, darling. I don't understand why it worked. It was such a such an idiotic thing to tell him to do. But it did work. You made it work. Wait. A week ago, I was passing by that rock, and I climbed up and took some scrapings of it with my knife, and I mailed them to a laboratory and asked them to analyze it. This letter is their answer. Mary, that rock, that silly flat rock lying out there in the sun, it contains a large percentage of kaolin. Of kaolin, Mary. Do you realize what that means? Well, I don't even know what kaolin is. It's a kind of clay, a very fine clay, almost invisible to the naked eye, and it has the property of absorbing things. Oh, it's famous, Mary. People use it in porcelain and for other things, but most importantly, they use it to correct the condition that was destroying poor Moses. Don't tell him. Don't tell Moses. Why not? Well, he wouldn't understand. And he'd rather think it was you. But I don't want him to think it was me. I'll get that. Nicholas, how are you? It's, uh, it's my wife, Mr. Mather. She's, she's very bad. Come in, Nicholas. What's the matter with Nellie? Uh, it, it's the migraine, Mary. And Nellie's half out of her mind with it. Uh, Mr. Mather, please... please. Do something for her. Nicholas, I know nothing about migraine headaches. What about the pills the doctor from the mainland gave her? Oh, they do no good at all. Darling, you must go. But I can't do anything. You'll think of something. Please. Please, Mr. Mather. All right, let's go. You will think of something. You always have. Nellie, I know how much it hurts. An anvil is being struck inside your head. Yes, it's just worse. I know, I know. She can't bear to move her head, not even to take some water. I'm not going to ask you to move your head, Nellie. I'm not going to ask you to move anything. I'm simply going to take your hands in mine. Here, first the right hand, then the left hand. There, that's all. That's all? Hush. This is between Nellie and me, Nicholas. Now, Nellie, try to look at me if you can. Look deep into my eyes. Yes? Look into my eyes, but don't think of me. Think only of your hands. Feel how cold they are. Oh, cold? Like ice? Now think of the ice melting. Think of sun shining on ice. Shining on your hands. Hot, hot sunlight. Hot. Your hands are getting warmer. Warmer? And warmer. And warmer. Why, your hands are beginning to feel hot, burning. Oh. I can hardly hold them. Don't let go. Because... Oh, don't Why? let go. Why, Mary? Because... Because my head is... It's beginning to clear. Good. Is it true? Is it true, Nellie? Oh, the pain. The pain is leaving me. Hold on to my hands till the pain is gone. Don't worry. I'll sit right here and hold your hands till the pain is quite, quite gone. It was ridiculous. I had no idea what to do. All I could think of was that you had said you'll think of something. And holding her hands was what I thought of. So I did it. And it worked. Yes, yes, it worked. I don't know why. Nellie had faith in you. But I don't care about Nellie or Moses or Judd or any of them. I only care about you. And I can't do anything for you. You love me. You make me happy. Do I make you strong and well and able to walk? Even raise yourself from that wheelchair? No. Then what good am I? What earthly good am I? Mary, I've been thinking of something Moses said to me that night during the storm. He said, he said, the reason I could help so many of the islanders was because they had faith in me. Oh, they do, darling. And he said that perhaps the reason I couldn't help my own wife was because, because you're not an islander and you don't have faith in me. Darling, I love you. With all my heart, I love you. But do you have faith in me? I mean, the strong faith. The kind of faith that moves mountains, as the Bible calls it. Do you? 
I only know I love you. Mary, I'm going to get that doctor from the mainland. One way or another, I'm going to bring him to this island. Without money. I'll mortgage my life. And without a boat. I'll borrow a boat. With no one to sail the boat? I'll manage. You'll see. You'll see. I'll manage somehow. Uh, Mr. Mather, uh, it's, it's Nellie again, another migraine. You must come. She's in such pain. Nicholas, not now. I, I have other things on my Please, mind. Please, Mr. Mather, you, you don't know how she suffers. Two weeks ago, when you cured her, that, that was bad enough, but this time, it, it, it's worse. You must come. Darling, go with Nicholas. You really want me to? I want you to. Very well, if my wife wants me to go with you, Nicholas. Come on. You will think of something, my darling. You'll see. You'll think of something. I know. It hurts, doesn't it, Nellie? I know it hurts. Your head is bursting with pain. Your stomach is churning. Mr. Mather, why do you just stand there? The, the light through the shutters pierces your eyeballs, doesn't it, Nellie? Aren't you going to take her hands, Mr. Mather, or tell her to look into your eyes? No. Why not? Are you going to do something else? No. But you can't let her suffer like that. Aren't you going to do anything at all? No, but you are. Me? What can I do? What I did. But I have no power, Mr. Mather, not like you. I'm going to give you my power. Come here. Pull that chair up to your wife's bedside. Sit down. Now, take your wife's hands in yours. That's right. <laughs> Nellie, look at your husband. Look at him. Nicholas. Dearest. Nellie, your hands are in your husband's hands. Now I'm going to put my hands on top of his hands. Whatever power is in me will pass from my hands into his. Do you understand? Yes. Do you understand, Nicholas? Yes. All right, then. Now look deep into your husband's eyes, Nellie. Never let your gaze wander. And you, Nicholas, keep your eyes fixed on the eyes of your wife. That's it. Very good. Neither of you knew the moment when I removed my hands. That means that my power went into the hands of Nicholas. And now the power in the hands of Nicholas is passing into your hands, Nellie. Yes. I feel... What do you feel? Heat. Heat in my hands. My, my hands are burning. They are burning, Mr. Mather. I can feel them. Like flame. Don't let go. Hold on, Nellie. How does your head feel? Oh, better. Oh, much better. Oh, Nellie. Uh, the pain is nearly gone. Stay like that, the two of you, for another ten minutes, and the pain will be gone completely. Oh, Mr. Mather. Oh, how can we ever thank you? I must be getting back to my wife now. Well, surely that there must be something we can do for you. you. You've done so much for us. Nothing, really. Oh, wait a moment. You have a boat, don't you? Yes, yes, I do. And Nicholas, you know how to sail it? Yes, yes, I know how to sail it. Will you take me to the mainland in your boat? Of course. And bring me back? Well, yes, I certainly will, Mr. Mallet. Fine. Sometime in the next couple of weeks. Oh, one other thing, Nicholas. You and I will be making the trip to the mainland alone. But on the return trip, there will be another man with us, a very important personage. Is that understood? Anything you say, Mr. Mather, we owe you so much. You will repay me in full. I am quite sure that there is at least one person who has faith in you. Is it your wife? Your husband? Your father or mother? A child? At the very least a dog or a cat who trusts you to fulfill the unspoken promises made by the very existence of your love for each other. Of course there is. No if, and I hate to utter the words, if there is not, then you must be the unhappiest person in the world. I'll be back shortly with Act Three. Weeks have passed since Mather mysteriously conveyed to Nicholas the means by which he might cure the migraine headaches of his own wife. 
In return, Mather exacted from Nicholas a promise to take him in his sailboat to the mainland. Now Mather is about to demand the fulfillment of that promise. Come in. Come in. Mr. Mather, come in. Come sit down. Have some coffee with us. Thank you, Nellie. Another, another time. Nicholas, today's the day. What day is that? Today is the day you take me to the mainland in your boat. Oh. You haven't forgotten your promise, have you? Oh, oh, oh no, no, no. Oh, we would never break a promise to you, Mr. Mather. Uh, how, how long will we be away? I, uh, I don't like to leave Nellie alone too long, you know, if one of her headaches should come back. It should take us the better part of a day to get there. Then perhaps part of a day to find the person I'm looking for. A little time to persuade him to come back here with us. Three days, probably. Four at the most, the very most. Now that you've shown me how to rid Nellie of her terrible headaches, I, I hate to leave her. Oh, Nicholas, you promised. You, you must keep your promise. Thank you, Nellie. Oh, I'll be all right. I know I will. And Oh, something else, Mr. Mather. Every day I'll, I'll go to your house to be sure Mary's all right. Mary does pretty well for herself. She knows how to get around in her wheelchair. Oh, yes, but she might need something from the store. And besides, she'd like the company, wouldn't she, with you away? Of course she would. <laughs> And it's very kind of you to offer. Nicholas, bring the boat to my dock in, we'll say, about an hour. Well, I could be there sooner, if you like. No. No, an hour would be soon enough. I want a chance to talk to my wife, tell her of Nellie's kind offer, and, and a few other things. Goodbye, and thanks to you both. A good journey, Mr. Mather. <laughs> I'll see to that. Mary. I'm right here, dear. I just talked to Nicholas. He's going to sail me to the mainland, and I'm going to see that doctor. I'm going to tell him about you, and I'm going to bring him back here. Oh, darling. My mind's made up. Without money. Before I go, my love, I must tell you a story about myself. Now, there's nothing about you I don't know. We've been man and wife for ten years. This is a story about me before we ever met, ever married. And I have to tell it to you now. It can't wait. Darling. I have to tell you now. If you must... All right. Before I met you, Mary, I may as well say it right out. I was one of the top ten swindlers in the country. Swindler? Con men, confidence men, men who... Men who trim suckers. I... I don't know what that means exactly. Men who pretend they have ways to make large sums of money for people who trust them. My favorite gimmick... Gimmick? A scheme. A scheme for getting money out of people. My favorite scheme was the dying stockholder pitch. Pitch? The tale I tell the suckers. The story. I tell them I was a financial developer of mining properties. But that's what you told me. I know. Yes, I know. Then I tell them that there was this silver mine out in Nevada or someplace that had been closed down five years ago when the vein ran out. But now the State Bureau of Mines had found a new vein and it was going to open it up again. Well, you told me... That... Wait, 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 wait. Then I tell them that the last quotation on it was a dollar a share, but if the mine was to be reopened, it would be worth ten. Oh, yes, dear, but... But I'd say that the only hitch was that the stock was held by a very, very old man, a very sick old man, a very sick old man who was desperate for money, and if he got it right away, he'd sell the stock at a dollar a share. Well, I know all this. I know you do. Because I told the whole story to you. And you gave me all your money, Mary. All your savings. Every penny you had in the world. But the old man died. He died before he could transfer the silver mine stock. That's what I told you. And he spent the money on doctors and nurses. That's what you said. And he never got around to sending us the stock certificates. So we had no proof that we'd sent him the money to pay for the certificates. That's what you told me. Oh, Mary, my sweetest, my dearest, my most beloved. There never were stock certificates. There never was a silver mine. There never was an old man who was sick and dying. Well, then... Then what happened to the money? I kept it. It's what we've been living on for the last ten years. But why... I don't understand. Why didn't you just... Just take my money... And, and go off somewhere. You must know the answer to that. But I don't. 
because I couldn't bear to leave you. But why not? Because I'd begun to love you. It was such a strange, such a new feeling for me because I'd never loved anyone in my life. I didn't know how to say the word. Even when I asked you to marry me, the word love wouldn't come to my lips. I remember. But you married me anyway, and... Oh, my darling. For ten years, such love has been growing in my heart. And I've watched it grow. And now, my dearest, I'm going to sail to the mainland with Nicholas. I'm going to find the doctor who will make you well, who will release you from that wheelchair so that you can walk, run on the beach with me. But we're happy the way we are. Dearest, tell me before I go. Tell me you forgive me for the lies I told you ten years ago. For the lie I've lived ever since. For ten years I've known all I needed to know about you. That you loved me. Nicholas will be along pretty soon with his boat. Let's just sit by the window and wait for him. And hold each other's hand. And not talk at all. I'm coming in. Oh, come on in, Nellie. Oh, Mary, I'm so sorry I'm so late. That's all right, Nellie. Yes, but I promised I'd be here first thing in the morning. Well, you have been every day. Oh, till today. Oh, I'm so sorry. Now, Nellie, don't make such a fuss. Here, there's coffee on the table. Help yourself. Oh, that I will. And then I'm going to tell you the most fantastic story you ever heard in all your born days. Well, I've heard a lot of fantastic stories in my time. Oh, well, not like this one you haven't. Oh, you, you want coffee? No, no, thanks. I've had plenty. Well, then, wait till you hear what I'm going to tell you. I'm waiting. But as you very well know, your husband and mine have been gone for three days. Your day will be the fourth day. Well, you know, Nicholas was very nervous about going because he didn't want to leave me. And but to tell you the truth, I was nervous about his going, too, for fear I might have another one of my headaches. Ever since your husband showed my husband how to make them go away, well, oh, you know all about that. Yes. Yeah, well, everything's been all right. And after all, they were only going to be gone three or four days. What could happen? Such a short time, and the trip was so important. Your husband said something about bringing somebody back to the island with them, some very important personage. A doctor. A doctor? Really? A doctor who might be able to help me. Yes, it, it's so strange that... Your husband can help everybody, but but he can't help you. Oh, he helps me. Just by living with me and loving me. Oh, but not to walk. No. But go on with what you were going to tell me. Oh, well, Mary, this morning I woke up and... What do you think? I don't know, Nellie. Tell me. Another migraine headache. That's what I woke up with. Oh, no, Nellie, no. I was in despair that the pain... But then, you know what I did? I lay quietly in my bed, and I thought of Nicholas, and I thought of your husband, too, I admit it, and I thought of how they held my hands and, and looked into my eyes, and how my hands grew warmer and warmer as they held them, and how the pain in my head grew less and less, and Mary, do you know what started to happen? Tell me. My hands grew warmer and warmer till they were hot. I did it myself, Mary, all by myself. I, I myself made my own hands grow hotter and hotter till I felt as though they were on fire. And little by little, the pain in my head started to go away. Nellie, how wonderful. So, so that's why I'm late coming to see you. Well, it's all right, Nellie. Truly, it is all right. Oh, well, the, the men should be on their way back by now. Yes, why don't you go to the window and look out? I'll make some fresh coffee. Oh, they're coming! They're coming! I can see the sails. There's, there's a good wind blowing. Good, good. We'll have coffee ready for them. Oh, they'll be coming up alongside the dock. Now, you'd best let Nicholas know you're here, Nellie. I will. Nicholas! Nicholas, I'm here. I'm here with Mary. She's making coffee. Hurry! Oh, they'll be right in. They're tying up the boat. I'll pour the coffee. You want me to do it? No, no, I want to do it. A cup for Nicholas. 
cup for my beloved husband. And a special cup for the wonderful doctor. Oh, shall I pour another cup for you? Why not? This is a very special occasion. <laughs> and one for me, too. That must be Nicholas. Oh, Nicholas. Oh, my dear, I have such things to tell you. Where's my husband? He's coming. And the doctor? Darling. Oh, darling, there you are. Look. Look at what we have for all of you. Fresh, hot coffee. Five cups. It's a special occasion, Nellie says. What's the occasion? Why, the... The, the doctor? Yes, the... Oh, where is the doctor? There is no doctor. You couldn't find him? Oh, yes, we, we found him. He... He wouldn't come? No, he wouldn't come. Was he... Was he afraid to make a trip? Yes, he was... He was afraid of the trip. Mary, I tried. I tried my best. Close the door, darling, will you? It's getting very cold in here. Mary... I told him I'd work for him for the rest of my life. Believe me. Stay where you are. Stay right where you are by the door. Mary, please. Don't move. Don't come near me. Mary, wh what are you doing? Don't any of you come near me. What is she trying to do? I... I think she... I think... Mary, are you sure? Very sure. Ve very sure. <gasps> Mary! Mary, what are you doing? I am... I am... very slowly... very surely... and very lovingly... walking into the arms of my husband. Hold out your hands, my darling. I am walking... I am walking... to greet you the door of our home. Oh, Mary. Oh, my Mary. Oh, my wife. <sighs> Without perfect truth, there can never be perfect faith. But when both truth and faith are perfect, why then, miracles happen. As one has just happened in our story called Faith and the Faker. I'll be back shortly. I cannot resist going back to my first definition of faith, the definition given us by the good book itself. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The lines bear repeating and deserve memorizing. The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That, dear listener, is faith. Our cast included Howard Da Silva, Mary Jane Higby, Rhina Rayburn, Guy Sorrell, and Russell Horton. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. When you're afraid your old man will yank Kate out of town, or at least hide her somewhere, it's now or never. How do we do it? Well, if your house wasn't in the country, we couldn't. Sure, the place is locked and barred, but uh, what we do is get a rope ladder up to Katrine's window sill. What about the guard? How do we get through the gate? I'll take care of him. He's a cinch. You'll stand aside while I rap with our friend. I'll be a drunk looking for a shot of booze and cure a hangover. Oh, Jody. Listen, it'll be a great act. I'll be falling down drunk, see? I get close to the guy, he's off guard. Wallow, I knock him out. You go up the ladder and persuade Kate to come down it. Can I persuade her? Oh, sure you can. You hold all the cards, sweetheart. That plan you've worked out for her is a winner. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by imported Vigna Rosé wine.
This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. I hope you enjoyed this episode of CBS Radio Mystery Theater. If you enjoyed this and want to hear more, please subscribe to this